Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Marine Board, European Marine Board third Thursday science webinar series. Um, <clears throat> I see it is one o'clock uh, Brussels time on the dot, so I think we'll start, even though I'm sure we'll have some people arriving a bit later. Um, so our third Thursday science webinar series is basically showcasing the science behind the Marine Board publications, um, and it happens, uh, the clues in the name, every third Thursday um, of the month. Um, and if you want to tweet about it, uh, you can see our hashtags and tags at the bottom there. <clears throat> so, uh, oopsie, I've gone too far already. So a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you are going to ask a question, please make sure that you have your name clearly entered um, in the question and answers Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you can put where you're from, that would also be helpful. Um, so if you want to ask questions, please do so. You can do so during the, um, during the, the, the webinar in the Q&A. Uh, and um, we, I will basically um, look at the questions as they come in and uh, pick which ones to ask in which order uh, once, uh, once the speaker is finished speaking. Uh, if you have any technical issues for technical support, you can use the chat feature. Um, and that's only visible to the host, so you won't be able, nobody else will be able to, to see it. So you can ask any technical questions there. And also, please be aware that we are recording this webinar. It will be going out on YouTube. Um, so uh, be aware of that for, um, uh, for, the, for making sure that you don't say anything inappropriate or typing anything in inappropriate. <clears throat> um, and you can get any information on the Marine Board on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, then today we will be focusing on the science behind our position paper number 24, which is called Navigate the Future 5. Um, and you can uh, download the document uh, from the website uh, link. And I think that um, our technical support, uh, Paula, will have put it in the chat so you can find it there. Um, Navigate the Future 5 was published in uh, June 2019. Um, and we launched it at our uh, conference Year Ocean uh, in, in June. Uh, it gives a big picture overview of the marine science that's required uh, in the future. So, you know, to 2030 and beyond. And it identifies key topics and themes that can significantly advance our understanding of the marine system and the broader earth and climate systems. Uh, we also have some nice um, infographics. So if you look on our website, you'll be able to find the infographics that go with the document. Um, so, without, without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker. He's Dr. Michiel van der uh, He is the research, head of research at the Flanders Marine Research Institute, uh, VLIS, here in Ostend. Um, and he will be giving us a talk that's entitled Navigating the Future 5 as an Inspiration and Direction for Marine Science in the Ocean Decade. So, Michiel, if you want to put your video on and unmute yourself, I will stop sharing my screen and then you can share yours and take it away. Thank you, Sheila. Now, take it away as you suggest. There we go. Okay, I see Sheila nodding that everything is fine. So we'll uh, head off um, and talk today about navigating the future, uh, the science behind the marine board uh, publications. But this will also be a bit about the science coming out of the Marine Board uh, publication, as these uh, um, uh, navigating the future five is uh, specifically a uh, foresight uh, document. I'll start with uh, yeah setting the scene. Uh, we're still in a very strange uh, situation now. Uh, the the past year, 2020, 2021, we've seen this. Uh, uh, COVID pandemic all over the world, uh, what you could call a societal challenge. Um, this is a, a global situation uh, that brought us many uh, scientific questions, uh, especially at the start of the pandemic. Uh, there were a lot of questions about variants of the virus and what they could or could not do, how the virus uh, could be spread. Uh, a lot of uncertainty, but then there also was a tremendous uh, scientific effort from uh, the scientists all over the world collaborating from uh, multiple disciplines, uh, leading to fast scientific breakthroughs from testing methods to models to uh, predict uh, the spread and the, the, the impact of the virus, 
up to the, the vaccines that have been uh, developed incredibly fast and that are leading us now slowed, slowly towards a, a more uh, normal uh, world to live in. Um, I'd, I'd like to see this as a, as a parallel with the, the, the situation that uh, our Earth system and our, our, our ocean uh, is into uh, today. Uh, it's also a, a global crisis, uh, if you want to call it so. There's uh, many societal challenges and the IPCC report that came out this month had highlighted it again that uh, especially the climate change crisis is uh, very urgent and, and, and upon us, uh, but there's also the biodiversity uh, decline and there's the need to uh, feed the, the growing amount of people in a, in a proper uh, and um, a qualitatively good way. So this brings uh, a lot of scientific questions uh, and um, back in, in 2019, many of those scientific questions related to the, the ocean, which is very central in, in, in our world and also in these societal challenges that are uh, so pressing upon us. Uh, those scientific questions have been gathered in the, this uh, document, uh, Navigating the Future 5, and um, they have uh, brought us already some scientific uh, output and uh, should move us onto scientific breakthroughs in this uh, special uh, decade, uh, which is also the United Nations Decade of um, Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, a bit back in time uh, to uh, Brussels uh, in November 2017, when I just started as head of the research department here at Flanders Marine Institute, and I had the opportunity to join an expert uh, working group brainstorming on ideas of um, uh, important scientific questions and knowledge gaps to put in uh, navigating the future five. It was at a time when brainstorming sessions could still be held at a table with actual papers and flip charts and pens that could be passed on from one to another. Uh, very inspiring discussions I was able to witness there. And then uh, in the next uh, months, I was invited to uh, co-author uh, the chapter on the multi-stressed and rapidly changing ocean. Uh, which was coordinated by, by Jeremy Gold. It was an interesting process to be part of. I'd like to, uh, to take this opportunity to thank all the co-authors and also the, uh, the excellent support of the, of the European Marine Board in leading to this, uh, this document uh, that we have uh, ahead of us uh, now. Uh, this uh, position paper, Navigating the Future 5, which was, as Sheila mentioned, launched in Paris in June 29 at the uh, EuroOcean Conference. And um, now uh, we are here, connected through the internet in a webinar in August 2021. And uh, I would like to uh, show you in this webinar that um, ways how Navigating the Future 5 has inspired science and science policy uh, over the past years, and uh, hopefully will uh, continue doing so for the next decade. So to uh, start with that, I will give you an, uh, an, uh, an overview of the, the main chapters, uh, the, the key scientific topics that uh, are identified in Navigating the Future 5. And there's a chapter on the, the four-dimensional uh, ocean, uh, a chapter on uh, multiple stressors um, uh, pressing upon the ocean, then a chapter on the signs of surprises relating to extreme events, a chapter on technologies, data, and, uh, and modeling, and a chapter on the sustainability science. So those are five chapters, five uh, knowledge gaps, scientific topics, if you want. But there are, of course, um, there are many links uh, between those themes. Uh, to give an example, uh, if you look at the, the impact of multiple stressors on the ocean, you can't see this apart from the, the four dimensional system that the ocean is. Uh, you, can, uh, you have to consider stresses and their impact uh, over space and over time. Um, these uh, stressors may give rise to more frequent or more intense uh, extreme events, so uh, linking to the signs of surprises. And we would need observations, but also data and models to uh, uh, be able to interpret and understand the mechanisms, how these stressors impact our, our four-dimensional ecosystem. And finally, the sustainability science is needed to get all actors involved to also uh, answer to the challenges that the stressors bring to the uh, ocean ecosystem 
and uh, tackle the, the drivers behind those stressors for a sustainable ocean future. Uh, and there, uh, the last chapter, um, Navigating the Future, also uh, highlights some, um, yeah, some uh, other uh, research teams uh, uh, on the midterm horizon, uh, research fields that are more or less overarching over those five topics. And that's again, ocean and climate change, uh, sustainable living resources and human activities in the ocean that are all linked to these, to these five topics. So uh, in the next section, I will uh, give some examples how navigating the future five uh, has been resonating in science policy and research programs and strategies uh, since, its, since its launch in uh, 2019. Um, a first uh, strategy framework that I'd like to touch upon here is the, the strategy framework of uh, JPI Oceans, uh, the Joint Programming Initiative. They have a, a framework uh, for uh, 2021 to 2025, so uh, relatively recent. And they work with uh, three uh, development ambitions, sustainability, responsibility, and blue economy, and then three priority areas, ocean health, ocean productivity, and ocean stewardship and governance, within which several themes or topics are put forward. And this sustainability uh, development ambition uh, directly links to the uh, science of sustainability of navigating uh, the future five. But if we look within the ocean health, uh, there is a clear connection to the four dimensional ocean with climate change, biodiversity and ecosystems. There's a connection to the multiple stressors with pollution as a team. And there's a connection to the technologies, models and data with uh, observation and modeling as a team. To give some uh, examples uh, from the content of this strategy framework, under ocean health, uh, uh, they quote, it's important to advance the understanding of the structure, function, and connectivity of marine ecosystems and functional links between ecosystems, physical processes, and a biogeochemical environment. Uh, this is almost literally coming from the chapter of the, of the 4D ocean. Uh, and uh, current and emerging environmental pressures, pressures are stressed, or cumulative effects assessment are highlighted uh, as they are highlighted in the uh, multiple stressor chapter of uh, NF5. And for ocean productivity, uh, they mentioned to uh, understand and predict changes to the ocean environment and to um, advance ocean observation, monitoring, and numerical modeling all items that are dealt with in the uh, technology data and model chapter. The next uh, research strategy uh, I'd like to highlight is uh, one of the uh, regional sea basin strategies that I was also involved in, in drafting for the Baltic and North Sea um, uh, region. Uh, it's called the BANOS uh, Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda. And here we see a number of uh, sub teams that are uh, uh, listed in this uh, SRIA. Um, and uh, you can also see links to the four dimensional ocean, uh, looking at interactions in the food web, for instance, to uh, the multi stressed ocean, where they uh, touch upon multiple drivers of change, pollution impact, uh, considering mixtures of chemicals in multiple decades. Also, this time aspect is coming on there. Uh, there are sustainability challenges, so sustainability science for the ocean is in there as well. And then looking at modeling and signs of surprises, uh, the tipping points are there. The digital ocean is something that comes back here, and we'll see coming uh, see this coming back in other instances as well. Uh, navigating the future, I think, was uh, one of the one of the first documents uh, pointing to this uh, digital ocean or digital ocean twin. Uh, where we need the monitoring and then again, again uh, this transformative actions for well-being and sustainability of all actors involved with the ocean. Then uh, at the, the European Commission level, uh, we have this uh, mission, uh, the mission on uh, uh, healthy oceans, uh, seas and, uh, and inland waters, uh, coastal and inland waters. Um, the document that was produced uh, last year, uh, uh, an expert document on what they have called Mission Starfish Restore Our Ocean and Waters, they refer to filling the knowledge and emotional gap where they uh, highlight modeling infrastructures, streamlining of observations, pooling of uh, accessible data, forecasting, the sequencing of ocean life DNA, 
and again this digital twin of the ocean so uh, clearly linking to our um, modeling um, uh, uh, data and uh, robotics uh, chapter and also to the 4d ocean and then active cooperation and co-ownership where the link to the sustainability science comes in play some examples from the Horizon Europe uh, work program 21-22. Uh, uh, and I mainly looked at uh, cluster six on uh, food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and the environment. Uh, some, some calls that uh, were out uh, relatively recent in uh, the past months. Uh, one on global biodiversity genomics, uh, again, highlighting the need for uh, models, data, and, and, and tools. Um, one on marine biodiversity and ecosystem services, taking into account the, the interactions in our for the ocean. One on cumulative stressors uh, and ecosystem services. One on observation and mapping marine biodiversity, where both the, uh, the tools and the uh, 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 diversity, the, the dimensions in space and time uh, come into play. Uh, one on the oceanic carbon cycle, uh, very important uh, for the ocean. The one on socioeconomic empowerment for users of the sea for a sustainable future, and one on ecosystem valuation, conservation, and restoration, as all examples that would clearly link to chapters in this uh, Navigating the Future 5. So after uh, giving you a flavor of how this uh, Navigating Future 5 uh, can be uh, seen or echoed in, in uh, research programs or research strategies, I will now give you uh, some examples of research that has been inspired by or, or contributes to recommendations from this document, um, mainly uh, from things that I have uh, experienced myself or was somehow connected to. But this is just a, uh, yeah, uh, to give you a flavor uh, and, uh, uh, of, of how uh, navigating the future has uh, resulted in actual research over the, the past years. And I'll do this chapter by chapter. Uh, so I'll start with the four-dimensional and connected ocean, um, uh, which uh, highlights this global change uh, that affects both the physical, the biogeochemical, and the biological ocean. Uh, and so there's, there's many changes uh, expected and already going on, as we know, over time. And the key recommendations here are to look at the framework for understanding the interactions. I think interactions really is a key word there, both in space and in time and between these different components of the ocean. And although it was not there in the infographic, I have added humans uh, as well, because if you read through the text, you will see that interactions between humans and this uh, for the ocean system are also a very important aspect. Um, a first example that I'd like to highlight here is a, a project that had been uh, granted by the European Research Council uh, that kicked off uh, this May uh, from a colleague at Ghent University, Griet Neukermans, uh, which is called Carb Ocean. And uh, she will uh, look with her team uh, and colleagues at uh, the biological carbon pump. So um, with uh, the, the aid of uh, robotic profilers uh, from the, the Argo network, uh, they will develop uh, a new type of sensor to better um, uh, understand the interactions and the constraints on the, uh, the uh, biological carbon pump. Uh, this is the, the system that uh, results in the uh, uh, uptake of carbon in the, in the deep ocean uh, where it is not in contact with the atmosphere anymore. So uh, this uh, contributes to a reduction of the uh, um, uh, carbon in the atmosphere. And there's two uh, important components to that, as you see depicted uh, here on the graph in the organic carbon pump. Um, Carbon dioxide is transformed into biomass by photosynthesis, resulting in particulate organic carbon. And then you have the carbonate pump, where uh, organisms uh, that calcify uh, form uh, calcium, calcium carbonate um, skeletons or shells, uh, they take up uh, bicarbonate from the water. And this is a process expelling uh, CO2 uh, from the ocean to the atmosphere. So both processes. Uh, work at the same time, and the uh, combination of both uh, result in a flux of particulate organic and particulate inorganic carbon to the deep ocean. At current, the knowledge gap is that there is a large uncertainty in the attenuation of those flows, 
and with uh, new sensors. That's why it also links to the uh, to the technology chapter of uh, navigating the future. Uh, they will develop a new sensor for detecting this particulate inorganic carbon uh, optically from uh, in situ uh, robotic profilers. So they have. Uh, then linking to this 4D aspect, um, depth profiles at different spaces in the ocean uh, to better understand this biological carbon pump. And next uh, example from, from at our institute at, uh, at FLIS, contributing to this, this 4D ocean is uh, to develop high quality long-term biodiversity and ecosystem data series. Uh, this is stressed in the, in the chapter that to better understand these interactions uh, taking on uh, or going on in a 4D ocean, we need uh, good quality observations uh, from different uh, aspects of our physical, biogeochemical, and biological ocean. And uh, we uh, at FLIS uh, have a tradition and will continue in uh, developing this uh, biodiversity and mainly biological uh, data series uh, as part of the, the LifeWatch program, for instance. We go out at different stations in the Belgian part of the North Sea and measure plankton uh, with uh, different kinds of sensors. To give an example of how we uh, look at those interactions uh, in the, the Blue Cloud project, which is a Horizon 2020 project that we're involved with, we've developed a uh, demonstrator for uh, plankton uh, essential ocean variables, where we uh, uh, use the data coming from our observations, but it's also expandable to other data from other observations to really uh, put them into a model in this uh, cloud environment to determine the main drivers uh, linking again to this physical and biogeochemical ocean, uh, resulting in uh, the phyto and zooplankton dynamics, uh, the biological ocean uh, over time. So again, this, uh, this fourth dimension coming in there. Uh, three other examples that I'll briefly touch upon. Um, one example is that we are going to go on a cruise uh, near Greenland uh, with the, the Eurofleets uh, program, where we will look at the, the three-dimensional distribution uh, and the steering factors of that, of zooplankton, in two contrasting uh, fjords of West Greenland. Uh, we use the video plankton recorder to get a 3D uh, image and we contrast a fjord with a land terminating and an ocean terminating glacier. Also with this uh, climate change in mind, uh, where in the future we'll probably have more land terminating glacier to understand these, uh, these interactions. Interactions with humans, uh, physical and biology, we have research on sea spray aerosols, where we look at how they are generated and how they scavenge biogenic components that can then interact with, uh, with human health. And um, uh, spatial interactions uh, and a different uh, angle is that we look at the functional variation of micro eukaryotic plankton in a Belgian part of the North Sea through uh, transcriptomics, uh, where we uh, look at the uh, different points in time and in space uh, to understand the function and the interactions again uh, between various uh, components of this uh, plankton group. Next chapter, the multi-stress and rapidly changing ocean, uh, where we have this uh, various human activities having an impact on the ocean, uh, which is already evident, various drivers of these, uh, of these stressors. And the key recommendations there are really to uh, develop a framework for understanding these interactions and look at them not in isolation, but uh, together. Uh, one example uh, that I'm not involved with, but I thought was uh, highly relevant to this is the, the iAtlantic project, the Horizon 2020 project, uh, coordinated from Harriet Watt University in the UK. Uh, and they have a specific work package on the impacts of multiple stressors on Atlantic ecosystems. Uh, they, they have the three examples here of uh, energy, uh, the need for food, and also the, the, the need for minerals. Uh, there's also a link to uh, exploiting the deep sea, the focus on, on deep sea ecosystems. Um, and uh, again, uh, there's interactions here between the multi-stress and the 4D ocean. Their baseline investigations are observations and modeling, uh, very uh, key that this is uh, being continued to set the baseline, but then they will carry out or are carrying out because it's an ongoing uh, project, lab experiments looking at single, but also multiple stresses effects on species and on ecosystems, where they want to identify those tipping points for deep sea ecosystems, uh, points after which changes go abruptly to a different ecosystem state. Uh, 
Um, the, we also mentioned in the in the, uh, the navigating the future five that for many new stressors uh, there still is uh, not enough knowledge on their impact uh, as single stressors. So, so we need to know that before we look at the, the interactions in the multiple stressors. Um, I'll give you two examples of microplastics that we have been involved with. Uh, you say microplastics, we've heard a lot about that, but we did not really know the actual impact uh, of it or the actual risk uh, that they pose to the, uh, to the marine environment. And uh, so we performed a, a study to actually apply the um, methods for, for chemical risk assessment also to microplastics in the marine environment to see also over time uh, how the, uh, the impact would, would change. And here you see uh, an image uh, linking to the spatial component uh, where uh, this is a spill house projection of the ocean where we want to put the ocean uh, more central in our, uh, in our uh, world uh, projections. Uh, and where the, the red uh, and white colors give rise to areas where in a worst case scenario, the uh, risk due to microplastics would be highest. Um, another uh, smaller example of a project that we're working at at VLIS is the, the, the so-called SUMES project, uh, where we are modeling the impact on uh, marine ecosystem services uh, in a framework of different blue growth activities. Um, this is uh, working with data, um, but also based on ecosystem modeling, ecosystem services modeling, uh, and it combines elements of risk assessment, but also of life cycle assessment. So there's this sustainability component as well. And in the end, we want to uh, support a decision framework uh, for sustainable blue economy development, where they can assess the uh, impacts of uh, various stressors, uh, but also potential positive results that um, blue economy activities may have. Third chapter uh, I'll tackle here briefly is this uh, science of surprises. Um, extreme events uh, that we are experiencing more and more, more and more now, having this impact on, on local ecosystems and four events that I mentioned, heat waves, floods, earthquakes, and tsunamis, all very relevant to the ocean. Uh, they have uh, results that can trigger uh, bigger uh, effects. Uh, and impact ecosystem services, but also uh, species and, and biodiversity. So some recommendations are to, again, uh, link to observations and, and technologies in the right place, uh, enhance your modeling and forecasting uh, so that we would be able to improve early warning systems. Um, I highlighted this uh, last, this month, actually, uh, the, the, the IPCC uh, report came out. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, stands out there is that uh, the climate change induced by our humans is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. And here you see Europe, it's land-based, not ocean-centered, but that there is an, indeed an, an observed exchange in, in hot extremes uh, linking to, to, to those heat waves. And one uh, example of research uh, clearly relating to uh, the signs of surprises is uh, research on meteor tsunamis. Uh, so the, the tsunamis caused by the meteorological uh, events and changes. And there has been a special issue on the global perspective on meteor tsunami science and natural hazards this year in 2021. And here you see a, a figure from this uh, publication uh, showing the, the spread of the authors, uh, quite many in Europe. And this is a, a distribution of those uh, meteor tsunamis uh, with uh, an indication of their intensity. So uh, they're in the North Sea, they're in the Atlantic, they're in the Mediterranean, they're in the Black Sea. It's an, it's an increasingly uh, um, investigated and researched uh, phenomenon. Uh, second last chapter, the novel technologies, the data and the modeling for ocean research. Um, it remains very important to support uh, answering questions in these other themes and topics. From novel technologies, it relates to new sensors, uh, very broadly uh, um, interpreted, uh, artificial intelligence and drones or uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, if I widen the scope a bit, uh, looking at future trends to have real-time data, near real-time data, to have them open and available uh, through various devices, uh, and to move towards an ocean internet of things with interconnected 
uh, sensors and a digital ocean uh, where uh, navigating the future they mainly refer to a virtual reality platform but this is of course supported by uh, um, uh, whole layers of data and models uh, that really uh, describe how uh, the ocean functions uh, in a virtual way. Uh, one example uh, that I, I uh, was also uh, uh, privileged to, uh, to witness is a um, um, workshop that was held uh, in the framework of uh, Euro Marine uh, workshops uh, on data needs for hyperspectral detection of algal bloom diversity across the globe. Um, Hyperspectral hyper satellites uh, take images of the, the, the whole spectrum of, uh, of light, uh, where uh, every wavelength can be interpreted uh, separately. So this brings a new uh, possibility of looking at ocean color. Uh, and uh, these experts have gathered to see how this can be uh, used to uh, observe uh, algal blooms or, or phytoplankton uh, groups. Um, this is something that we are now, now also taking on by including uh, radiometry, hyperspectral radiometry measurements when we have our monthly uh, phytoplankton uh, samplings and observations uh, to improve the, the calibrations and the um, information we can get out of those uh, satellite data at a later point in time. Looking at new sensors, uh, I also think of this um, and it's also mentioned in the Navigating the Future, the large amount of uh, opportunities that the new molecular biology methods bring about in terms of, of observations. And there's two uh, developments I'd like to, to highlight uh, in that uh, regard. Uh, one is uh, connected to the European Marine Biological Resource Center that uh, launched a marine omics biodiversity observation network, EMOBAN, uh, where we take part in sampling uh, biota from different uh, marine components within a European framework that are then uh, sequenced centrally so that the, uh, the sequence data get available for researchers to uh, understand those interactions uh, between the various um, components in our 4D ocean. Um, at a larger scale, uh, the Partnership for the Observation of the Global Ocean has launched an initiative in, case, in the framework of the Ocean Decade, uh, the Ocean Biomolecular Observation Network, uh, also aiming at, uh, it's, a, it's a decade action, a program, uh, understanding um, effects of stressors, but uh, uh, getting a, a good insight in the functioning of our 4D ocean through uh, biomolecular observations uh, for which technology is still rapidly, rapidly uh, improving as we speak. Looking at these um, uh, drones, uh, but uh, a bit wider scope, the robotics uh, and, and uh, the ocean internet of things. Uh, this is an, an, uh, an image making by our robotic center. Uh, we have been developing a, a modest robotic center at the Flanders Marine Institute. But with a, with a clear ambition to um, uh, contribute uh, to this ocean internet of things and to move more and more towards a system where there is communication between various sensors, being it profilers, moorings, uh, or, or uh, autonomous vehicles like uncrewed surface vehicles or uh, autonomous underwater vehicles that can then uh, take on data that have been measured and transfer them uh, through satellites or through, uh, through a ship uh, passing by in the neighborhood automatically to uh, increase the amount of data and information we have moving towards this, uh, this digital ocean twin. Um, two examples from Vliss on, on uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and new measurements. Uh, one is from uh, one of our PhD students working on uh, plankton identification, where he integrates data uh, that have been sampled from the physical ocean, so environmental uh, metadata, also by geochemical nutrients, pigments, but uh, classical CTD data. Uh, with data from uh, plankton, uh, mainly phytoplankton, uh, which is analyzed with images with a flow cam device, but also molecular uh, bio, bio, with molecular bio, biology through metagenome analysis. 
And uh, this gives you the taxonomic composition. Uh, the uh, flow cam uh, information gives you cell abundance. And taking all this information together with the uh, convolutional neural network classifier would give us a complete sample description, uh, which is more information that you could obtain from those various sources separately. Another example is uh, another PhD student, Clea, uh, who is working on underwater sound. Uh, and she is uh, looking at various ways to uh, detect uh, what are the sources of uh, underwater sound, uh, which components is underwater sound consisting of, uh, how does this, form, does this form what we call an acoustic habitat? But also if we detect an acoustic habitat, what does this mean for the biota, for the physical ocean, but also for humans, uh, uh, human activities in the ocean? And there's also, uh, artificial intelligence at play in disentangling uh, these various components. Uh, the last chapter uh, that uh, is uh, uh, a knowledge gap uh, uh, in navigating the future five is sustainability science for the ocean, um, where uh, it was uh, noted that uh, many times scientists are still working in silos uh, with uh, broken bridges between social, natural sciences and humanities, uh, and that actually these should work together and, and uh, collaborate to solve social challenges, challenges and improve the management of, of our marine resources. So uh, they recommend to put sustainability at the core of the marine research agenda and to educate sustainability scientists and have a, a marine sustainability forum to uh, make these interactions happen. And we've seen uh, sustainability as a more or less an overarching theme in many of the um, research agendas and uh, research policies uh, I mentioned to you in the beginning of my presentation. Uh, it comes back uh, in, in, in many research projects that are taking shape as well. Uh, but it's something that uh, merits continuous uh, attention. Um, I just give one uh, example of a project that we're working at uh, in Vlis, uh, where I thought it was apt uh, to, to show this, uh, these interactions. It's an interact project, North Sea Rex, uh, where we're uh, aiming at uh, getting information about the risks uh, caused by wrecks and uh, associated ammunition, mainly shipwrecks and uh, airplane wrecks from the world wars uh, that uh, have ended up in the North Sea. There's many of them. Uh, and we work together with, a, with an international team uh, consisting of geologists, marine biologists, toxicologists, data scientists, and also legal experts, historians, and archaeologists to uh, move towards a kind of risk tool that eventually would lead to uh, risk mitigation of those wrecks and munitions, uh, in which we also, and that's important, uh, interact with the relevant public bodies in an, uh, in an advisory board. So uh, moving on from the science to what can be done with the science and how uh, the, the, the challenges that have been detected can be tackled is also an important aspect highlighted by navigating the future in this uh, sustainability science. So that was a, a, a summary and some examples of how navigating the future has uh, inspired science policy, but also actual research projects going on uh, since its launch uh, two years ago. So uh, we are here now uh, connected through the internet. Um, I'm here in the gray Austins, uh, but we should also look at how we can navigate the further uh, future. And um, I'd like to invite you all to, to read uh, the document again. Uh, I have it on, on paper with me and there's already a lot of underlinings and, and papers in between. Um, I also want to refer to the, the, the nice policy brief that the Marine Board has published uh, in October 2019, uh, where they point out that what is in navigating the future actually is highly relevant uh, to um, uh, shape science for the, the ocean decades. Uh, this is an, an, uh, a diagram from this policy brief linking the uh, navigating the future five chapters to the societal outcomes of the decade. You'll see there's many uh, interaction and links. So I hope I was able to uh, 
inspire you a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, have a look at the documents. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to many more examples of uh, research and science uh, that answers the recommendations and fills the knowledge gaps that have been detected in navigating the future five in the coming years. Thank you very much. And I'm open for uh, questions. Thank you very much, Michiel. Maybe you can um, stop sharing your screen. Why not? Thanks. Um, so thank you. That was great. It was wonderful to see how, um, you know, the, the stuff we wrote in NF5 is actually coming to fruition. And, and I, I have uh, tweeted extensively. So anybody who knows uh, that they'll probably get quite a lot of that back in, in Twitter. Um, so uh, I see we haven't got any questions yet. This is always what happens. People are so nailed to, to uh, what you're saying that they forget to ask questions, but I already have some questions. <laughs> um, I'll start with um, COVID and, and how you think what we wrote in NF5 um, might adapt or might, how do you think COVID has, will make what we have in NF5 more or less relevant? Yeah, thanks. That, that refers back to, to my first slides, uh, right? Uh, it, ma it made me think of that when, 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 I, when I took an NF5 at hand again in preparation of this, uh, of this webinar, that, yeah, we are, since 2019 and the launch of NF5, we went to a very strange period that no one could foresee. And so actually uh, the, the, the chapter of Science of Surprises that was one big surprise for the whole world. Uh, so uh, at least uh, this was something that NF5, I think, rightly stressed that we should somehow be prepared for a science of surprises and also be prepared as a marine scientific community to adapt to, to sudden changes in, in, in what happens in the world. Uh, so um, that is there for that chapter. But then also uh, COVID has shown us that and that's, that's a hope I still have, and, and I've heard it from many people, that it's shown us that when we are forced to, to cope with a global challenge that is quite urgent, science can do a lot. And also the confidence in science in, in, in the wider world, I think, has benefited from COVID. You always have the, the exceptions and the, the complot theories and, and whatnot, uh, but I think generally, and that's, that's also been investigated, and there's you have the, the importance of the social sciences again to have a look at that as it is in, the, in the, the impacts of the marine sciences. But what I wanted to say is that the, the, the general appreciation for science and what they have done to, to cope with this COVID crisis, I hope this will uh, lag behind the COVID crisis to also show the general appreciation that science can, uh, can uh, offer for solving these other societal challenges as climate change, as our biodiversity decline, where our ocean plays such a major role in understanding how it works, but also in moving towards solutions to, to tackle it. Thanks. And, and following on from that, um, yeah, I was actually wondering the, you know, we have quite a, a bit in, in the robotics about robotics and artificial intelligence and, and making sure that we have a digital twin of the ocean. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, when COVID just happened, we couldn't go out to, to collect our, our moorings. You know, there were ships that had to come back to Europe. Um, so do you think that the way we'll collect samples in the future might be adapting quicker? because of COVID? I mean, these are questions nobody has an answer to, but I would, I would ask it anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, do, I do think so. I think it's an evolution that was already ongoing uh, towards more automation, uh, towards um, this uh, faster transfer of data, this uh, near real-time uh, data um, uh, availability. But COVID, of course, has confronted us with the yeah, with the lockdowns and the uh, the people having to stay at their homes uh, in their cot, like they said in, in Flemish. 
Um, also, also at Liz, it was, uh, yeah, it has, it has uh, impacted our, our monthly cruises uh, that could not go on with, with the research yeah. vessel. But then again, we saw that with our robotics, for instance, uh, we were able to, uh, to perform sound measurements in a COVID safe way. Uh, so that, 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 Kind of accelerated yeah. the process that we had planned to do it anyway, but yeah. then uh, our underwater sun me measurements could go on uh, during COVID times. And um, more and more um, smart uh, autonomous uh, vehicles will uh, become more and more common uh, and will uh, be able to deal with the sometimes busy and difficult conference uh, um, uh, circumstances they, they encounter at sea. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that the, the, uh, the global lockdown situation uh, at first has demonstrated the possibilities of automatic and autonomous measurements, and, and second, have accelerated the developments towards, towards that. So uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that that is something that will uh, increase the uh, path towards this digital ocean twin. Yeah. Um, then we have um, we have two questions from from the marine board team, but I will go to the open question that everybody can see in the question and answers. That's Cedric Bacher. Um, he says uh, he likes the comparison with COVID, but uh, there's a very very important differences. The first one is that the COVID COVID crisis is targeted um, and short term. I'm not convinced that that's just, it's going to be as short as we all would hope it to be. Um, and he says that this two, these two characteristics make the policy more efficient, hopefully, um, uh, as opposed to the mid and long term effects of multiple stressors and the need for interdisciplinary science in the ocean. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. Ho hopefully, it's it's a short term event, but I, I can understand what uh, what Cedric says. Of course, the uh, implications are uh, upon us much more shortly than the implications of multiple stressors acting for years on, on the ocean until a tipping point might be reached. Uh, so in terms of uh, inciting um, policymakers and, and, and the wider uh, stakeholders to action, of course, COVID uh, is, is much more urgent and pressing. But I think then it's up to us as scientists and as, and as a wider community uh, involved with marine sciences to uh, really uh, go out and showcase the, the, the um, examples of where multiple stressors have already affected our ocean. Uh, there's, there's plenty of them, but they're, they're too unknown. And there comes the, the, the sustainability science again uh, at play, the interaction. The, the, uh, the sustainability forum, the, the importance also of ocean literacy to really get the world, um, get them to know why it's so important that we also act on this more long-term um, stressors and, and, and uh, processes going on into, into the ocean. Uh, and at the same time, some things are becoming shorter and shorter term, unfortunately, uh, as we speak. So the urgency there uh, yeah. might uh, increase uh, in the coming years as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then there's a question from Ana Laura Lopez, um, who it's the middle of the night for you, Ana, really. She's in Australia, as far as I know. Uh, she says, uh, you talked about si the science sustainability in light um, of the very large and concerning issue of marine debris uh, where do you think technology development should go to reduce the marine science footprint? I'm, I'm not sure if I completely understand what she means with so, marine science so, footprint. So basically, um, you know, we, we often, we often um, put stuff at the bottom of the ocean with, with landers, for instance, and then we, we jettison the, the weights and just let the, the stuff go. So I think that's what she means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. No, that's a, that's a valid point, I guess. Um, yeah, uh, interesting question. Uh, I haven't given that much thought myself, but it is, it is important not to uh, uh, forget ourselves as marine scientists in all the issues that we're, uh, that we're talking about. 
uh, the, the obvious answer to me would be to <laughs> basically remember where you put stuff and go and take it back. But of course, inevitably, inevitably things get lost at sea. Yeah? That's that's what happens uh, um, all the time. So there, there might be an, uh, an uh, one of the technological solutions is to develop uh, materials uh, that uh, are the, yeah, the, the magical combination between robust and withstanding the harsh conditions at sea, and at the same time, degrade in a reasonable amount of time when they, when they, would, when they would get, uh, get lost and end up in the, in the, in the pool of uh, marine debris. Yeah. But, um, she, also, she also said in the chat, she means like Argo floats, for instance. I mean, we throw yeah. in the water and, and hope that we'll be able to find them back eventually. And I don't know what XBTs are, Anna. You're going to have to explain that. <laughs> no idea what an XBT is. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so I think that's the point is that as scientists, we have a, a footprint, even if we, you know, going out on ships, that's quite an expensive carbon footprint. Flying down to go uh, to, to join a ship, for instance, if you're going to the Southern Ocean, there's a carbon footprint. So we, as scientists, we have to think about that as well. Yeah, and, and, and adding to that, uh, when, when I was talking about this digital ocean twin, there was a, a colleague working in our data center that uh, pointed at the, uh, the carbon footprint of large uh, data infrastructure as well and, and yeah. Yeah. modeling yeah. and calculation uh, yeah. installations that's something yeah. that is relatively invisible uh, yeah. to people working with it but that's also a very important aspect of course in terms of sustainability science and working towards a sustainable future uh, we should not uh, work out a, a carbon uh, spewing a monster yes. of, a, of a digital <laughs> ocean twin to better understand the impact of carbon on the on the ocean. On the, the ocean, yeah, yeah. yeah precisely. Um, uh, I, um, and let's come back with XBT is expendable bathymet bathy thermographs. I have no idea what that is, but we can all Google that later. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll go back to the questions. Oh, hold on, we've got two. No, we don't. I'll go back quick to the questions that uh, Paula had. Uh, Paula and Angela had questions. So she said, uh, Paula said, how do you think the recommendations that we made in NF5, which is at a European or para European, you know, bigger than European level, how well do you think have they filtered down from Europe to the national and regional levels? I mean, you have put in the ban on, in Banos, for instance, and in JPI Oceans, it's kind of taken up. But do you, how well do you think it's filtered down to the national level? Um, do you yeah, think that that's that's something uh, something to uh, to be seen? I think I've, I've mentioned uh, I've mentioned the Banos. Uh, that's of course. Uh, developed with many national experts, uh, so from from national, mainly national science funding uh, uh, agencies and institutes. Um, I know for uh, for uh, for instance, if I if I think of the situation in in, uh, in Belgium, there's uh, uh, there's recently was a was a call from the from the Belgian science policy in. Uh, for utilizing our, the the new research vessel that that they will uh, uh, put into into sailing next year, um, there is sustainability science was 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 one of the aspects that's that's uh, in in the context as well. So, I think that's that's of course goes wider than than what was in NF five, but it, it shows that in the marine context it is important and it remains important. And I don't have sight on on the the, the trickling down to to other national uh, programs. Uh, I know that you guys are, are uh, being uh, track of it. If people tell of, us in evaluation <laughs> of that, so I'm also yeah. planning to look into that more in, in, the, in the course of next week. Uh, but I do know that it's a, it's a document, and the series of documents is well known at at, uh, at national science policy levels and at national. Um, uh, levels uh, working in the in the marine realm. So, yes. uh, me myself, before I was working at the France Marine Institute, I had uh, come across navigating the future three and four uh, through various channels. So, I'm quite confident that also five is 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 taken up uh, at those yeah. uh, at those levels. Yeah, yeah. 
certainly know that um, Gilles Lericla, our, our chair, always mentions that that it's sort of on the on the disc of, of you know the Ephraimer chief. So at least that in France it's also taken up. Um, and then there's a question from Angel. Uh, he says that uh, you really enjoyed your involvement with developing NF5. I think uh, we all enjoyed having you there. Um, so what would you recommend to scientists that, um, that are willing to get more into policy and research priority setting? You know, what would be your recommendations to other scientists who are maybe um, very much focused on their science? Why is it worth them doing something like this? Because this is obviously not pure science in that sense. It's really trying to make it outreach in that sense yeah I, th I think one one of the largest benefits to me personally is that it's it it opens your view to the to the, the scientific world and, and the marine scientific world um, i was involved uh basically from my background more in, in marine ecotoxicology uh at that time uh, which was a logical link to the multiple stressor effect mm -hmm. But then uh, discussing with, uh, with the colleagues in this chapter three on, the, on the, the, the time aspect of the rapidly changing ocean and then being involved in seeing the, the, the whole uh, document taking shape makes you think of links that you may not have thought of if you would uh, keep working in your specific field of science. And I think it, even though you don't directly um, put this into action or, or, or do something with it on the short term it's it's uh, it sticks with you in the longer term and at some point uh, you will you will you will reap the, the fruits of it and it's uh, it's it's a very nice way of interacting with with various experts uh, in the field anyway yeah indeed I mean I think it's uh, it's certainly the, the kind of thing that if you have a random discussion with a physicist, over coffee at some stage, something will might trigger and, and some biological process will become more interesting because you know the physics behind it. It's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's those kind of things. I, I remember the coffee breaks at this, uh, at this brainstorm session back in Brussels mm -hmm. were hugely interesting because, because of the, the various uh, discussions at the tables trying to focus on, 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 on chapters for navigating the future five. Yeah, loosened so many stories and, and ideas with the people involved that then getting all those things together uh, really uh, uh, spoke to the imagination. And, yeah, and, yeah. and that's what, uh, what science is about to a certain extent, is to, to let this imagination work for, for creating new ideas and hypotheses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we're nearly um, out of time. Um, I, I will say that uh, um, Anna, um, Anna ha, uh, Laura Lopez have put the, the link to the um, to to what an expendable bathythermograph is in in the chat. So maybe if I can ask uh, Paula or somebody to put it into the chat for everybody to see, then they then everybody can know what these things are. Um, but other than that, I just want to say thank you again to Michiel. It was really wonderful to talk about NF5 with you again. Um, and I will just share my screen again uh, quickly if I can. Oopsie. Uh, and, then, um, and then I will talk about our next, um, our next, hold on. Let me just, yeah, there we go. So next, uh, next month, our next third Thursday science webinar will be um, on involving stakeholders in co-creation of ecosystem services research. So this is based off the um, Valuing Marine Ecosystem Services document. And we will have two speakers. Um, the first one is Linwood Pendleton, who um, you guys might have heard. He was in our forum on big data and uh, some other um, things. And Tara Hooper, um, they were both co-authors on a specific paper that was quite uh, relevant. So um, I'm really looking forward to that one. So uh, Thursday, the 16th of September at um, 1300 hours uh, Brussels time. So uh, with much, with no much further ado, I just want to say thank you to everybody. And um, yeah, we'll see you in uh, a month's time. And thank you very much to everybody for being there. Thank you very much, Michiel, for um, for the wonderful discussion and to the team behind um, who has made sure that it all runs 
uh, perfectly uh, from a technology point of view. 